So let's continue on with Hari Bhakti Vilas. We're in the 11th Vilas and we're talking about codes of good conduct. And this will take us all the way to the end of the Vilas, this section. Um, and we're talking about general codes of, of etiquette and Vaishnava etiquette, Brahminical etiquette, and codes of conduct. Some of them make sense only in certain times, places, and circumstances. So some of them may seem strange, but but in order to understand exactly why they've been put here or, or, or why why these rules are, are instituted, we may have to do some research and, and see, for instance, what scriptures they come from, what's the context that they're that they're written in, and what sort of society you know was at the time like that. So these may not be applicable to all times, places, and circumstances, and it certainly can be adjustments. So let's continue on. I think we were at um, text seven, text seven eighty two. So here we have now. I'm, where's this te these texts from? Uh, if we look back, we'll see the last mention. I think the last mention of was probably some Purana. I believe. I'm not sure Vishnu Purana or something like that. So we, we we don't exactly know where all these all these rules are coming from. Yeah, it's just a big long list of uh, etiquette and rules of conduct. Uh, and see, yeah, see, so it starts at, is also stated. And if we go back, so we're going back 30, if we go back 30 or more verses, we finally get to Kurma Purana. Here we go. Kurma Purana, the Asa Gita of Kurma Purana. That seems to be the last quoted scripture. So, so maybe if we look in the Kurma Purana, we can uh, we can find all of this, or maybe not. So uh, we're going to start with seven eighty two. So verse seven eighty two. Um, one should not fan himself with a cloth. <clears throat> Absolutely no idea why you shouldn't fan yourself with a cloth, but um, somehow you shouldn't fan yourself with a cloth. I guess maybe. Maybe you're wearing the cloths that you're wearing, either two cloths or one cloth for a lady. You know, you shouldn't fan yourself with that cloth. I don't know. I don't understand. One should not sleep in the deity room. Well, that sort of makes sense. The, the, the Garba Griha, the puja room in the house or the, or the Garba Griha uh, in the temple, the, the actual deity room, room of the deity. Um, don't sleep in there like that. That place is for, for the, the deities of, the Supreme Lord, and so we shouldn't sleep there. That, that makes sense. So one should not walk through fire. And in fact, there are some, of course, you see sometimes you see some, you know, there are, ex, there are uh, exceptions to all of these rules. So there might be some, some instance where you see some different pujas in India and different uh, places around the world, which are performed by the Indian diaspora, you know, Hinduism, and Vaishnavism around the world, where people actually do walk on fire, you know. Um, okay, so one should not walk through fire. But in, again, we were talking about not spitting in fire, not, you know, so fire is considered sacred. It's the most subtle material element that we know of, that we can see. Of course, there's air and ether are more subtle, but fire uh, is, the, is, the, is the first, uh, first material element, um, most subtle material element with form. Okay, so you should not walk through a fire. A, a herd of cows. Okay, so if, if you're a cow herd, you know, like Krishna was, um, Krishna and Balram, are you not going to walk through a herd of cows? Probably you will, like that. Maybe the idea here is, is um, normally you shouldn't walk through a herd of cows or any animals whatsoever because you might, you know, maybe you get injured by the animals. You should be careful. Or a group of brahmanas, a group of brahmanas. So this is for another reason, another reason here. So um, the, these are all put in one sentence. So what they have to do with each other, I don't really understand. But walking through a group of brahmanas uh, may, be, may be disturbing to them. Maybe you end up 
walking on their shadows, which is considered an offense. So there, so there could be some, there could be some reasons not to walk through a group of Brahmins. Of course, if you're a Brahmin and you're part of that group, you're walking with the Brahmins. So, you know, there's obviously exceptions to this. One should not knowingly step over the shadow of a Brahmin or a cow. Okay, so that makes sense in respect to the previous sentence that, that you shouldn't stand on a shadow, which is considered part of the person, a subtle part of the person that accompanies him, right? It's a shadow of a Brahmin or a cow. So we shouldn't step on it out of respect. So this is just an etiquette like that. Now, is it something that people always are very careful to avoid, even in India, even today? I don't think so, you know. Um, but, you know, if, if possible, we shouldn't, obviously we shouldn't walk on the shadow of, of cows and brahmanas. But at the same time, there are a lot of other uh, etiquettes which are more important than that. Today, we're trying to tell people not to kill a cow, not to kill brahmans, not to, not to uh, uh, harass brahmans or something like that, or uh, priestly people or intellectual people. You know, um, if, if stepping on their shadows is the only thing that happens, I think it's much, obviously much less uh, problematic. But anyway, it's considered to be an offense, a very subtle offense there. So one should not allow a sinful or diseased person to step on or over his shadow. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to stop a, how are you going to stop a, a sinful person, right? Number one, we're in Kali Yuga. Everybody's sinful, basically, right? Uh, <laughs> even, even other religions, they recognize that, you know, this, the, the, the Christians are always saying we're all sinners. So yeah, this material world is a place of sin. Practically speaking, if you look in the Vedic scriptures, it'll say that there are five places where the householder in his house is committing sin. You know, the fire, the, the, the sw by sweeping, you know, by, by water, by pouring water, there's, there's microbes in the water. So there's so many, there's so many uh, <laughs> reasons, you know, just we get a mosquito and we, slap the mosquito when the mosquito bites us so there's there we are committing sins practically speaking just by breathing in this material world just by existing in this material world there are so many unknown sins that we plus the sins that we know of that we and that we purposely perform okay so okay so having having said that that everybody basically is sinful in this material world with the you know with the uh, noted exception of of great Vaishnavas and, and pure persons like that. We can say who are, who are considered sinless like that, even if they're considered sinless, um, somebody could insist that, they, that they're just by being in this material world, they're involved in some sort of sin. So, okay, so how are you going to stop uh, people from stepping on your shadow? I, I have no idea how to, how to do that. Maybe don't, maybe meet people in a dark room. I don't know. So there's, there's, you know, or a diseased person. And what does that mean, diseased, also? Um, a lot of us are diseased. You know, we have certain forms of diseases. There's different levels of disease also. Um, some people could say <laughs> old age is a disease. Age is a disease. Who knows? You know, so how exactly this is to be implemented properly it's an interesting sentiment it's a nice sentiment it's the, the idea is that that um that the shadow is obviously part of you know considered a subtle part of the person and therefore we should not disturb the brahmins and the cows shadows and we should also be careful of other people stepping on our shadows okay one should stay away from the dust that arises from sweeping okay so this is, this is very interesting. So in some places, like for instance, in Bengal, they're very fond of, and some other places also, they're very fond of, if they're gonna sweep, they take water and they sprinkle the water down first. If you're in a very dusty place, and believe me, um, you know, even though it doesn't appear to be dusty, a place can be dusty. If you, let, let's say you go out of your house for a few days and come back, you'll see a layer of dust. So there, practically speaking, every all the air has a has particles in the air, and this this is called dust. So sometimes we live in a place where there's smog and industrial pollution in the air. Other places we live in a very 
clean atmosphere like Hawaii, you know, like that. But even in Hawaii, there's dust. Even in Sri Rangam, there's dust. Okay, even though these places are not very industrially uh, active places. So, okay, there's dust, right? So there's naturally going to be dust, and dust is dust is dust comes up when we sweep. If we sweep, you know, most of the dirt stays on the on the broom, it stays till we till we get it into the container to throw it away. But some of it naturally goes up into the air with fine particles in the air. Now that that can, that can be that can get on us, that can pollute us, right? Because we don't, you know, we take bath and we wear fresh clothes and everything like that. We don't want to go in a dust storm or, 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 uh, you know, cover ourselves with dust. You know, we're not elephants. The elephant goes and bathes and comes out and then throws dust on itself to somehow or other. That's part of an elephant's bath. So we don't want to do that. So when you're sweeping, in order to avoid dust coming up like that. Uh, we can also say, you know, if somebody's sweeping and somebody else is, is, is taking an offering to the deity, the, the offering should be covered so that no dust, you know, touches the offering. Uh, you know, when we have, uh, we've, we've seen that people in India, a lot of times they'll cover water. They have a water pot or they have a, a, a glass or, or a cup with, with water in it. They'll put a cover on the top so that dust doesn't come in, inside it like that. So in the same way, when we're sweeping, if you first throw down water, then the, the water catches all the dust and turns it into, you know, it's absorbed with the dust and makes it heavier. And therefore, it can just be swept without coming up into the atmosphere. So they do this a lot in places, in many places. You'll see that, that people throw water down and then they sweep after they, after they throw the water down. Now, if somebody is sweeping before they throw the water down, sometimes you have to sweep. There's just too much dirt, too much dust to throw water on it, and you just you will end up with mud. So sometimes you have to have an initial sweep or take a shovel and get away, get the dirt away. And then when you've got very little dust there, then you can throw some water down and get rid of it, the rest of it like that. So this is all part of Brahminical cleaning, you know. So it's very, very good uh, that they've mentioned this here. Okay, so stay away from dust that arises from sweeping. So a good way to do that. First, throw water down. So from water wrung out uh, of a wet cloth. So stay away from dust, from sweeping. Stay away from water wrung out from wet cloth. Okay, so there is a system where we perform the bath, the ritual bath in the morning with, uh, with in a tank or a river or from water from a well like that. Um, and if you want to perform a ritual, ritual bath with all the Vedic mantras and things like that, then there's also a system of offering uh, Rishi, Deva Rishi Pitri Tarpanam or, or water ablations through the right hand at the end of the bath. Uh, at the same time, at the same time, there we are offering tarpana for devatas, for, for deities, de demigods, for uh, rishis, for the great sages, and for pitris, for the for the ancestors, like that. Then also we have to we have to also offer a, a, um, some water for people who are unknown, uh, who, who are unknown, maybe forefathers that we don't know about or, or, or for people who don't have progeny to offer tarpana to them, people who have died without having children to do the tarpana for them as pitris like that. So one of the ways to do that is, is that there's a system of taking the upper cloth that you're wearing while taking bath and squeezing that and the water comes out and that's that's considered ablation, an ablation to unknown pitries and things like that. So that, that's, a, that's an example of, of water wrung out from a wet cloth. Now, if it's just, that's for ritual purposes, right? So that's, a, that's an ablation of a certain type. If we just simply, simply get some cloth and we're using the cloth to dry something, dry up some water that's spilled or something like that, then we wring the cloth out obviously that is dirty water right so we should avoid that dirty water whereas the water that i talked about which is the ablation of uh after the ritual bath of wringing out the cloth after the ritual bath that is that is a pure ablation right because that cloth is clean you took bath and you wash it while you're taking bath and you wring it out like that so that that water i would say that's probably an exception here of course we're not wringing that water out on us, you know, but we're wringing it out as an ablation like that. 
anytime we're using a cloth to actually soak up water, right? That water may be contaminated in some way, and therefore we should, when we wring it out, avoid the water that comes out of it like that. We have to clean the cloth after we use it to soak up, so, soak up water, to um, clean up water like that. It also has to be clean. So avoid water wrung out from a wet cloth. Okay, so and 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 from water, and from water in a container that, that was used to bathe. Okay, so we should stay far away from water in a container that is used to bathe. So there may be a container of water that's used for bath like that, and we should we should um, stay away from that water. Okay, what people do in India is normally they have a big container which is thrown down in the well, right? A big bucket or a, or a kumba, right? With a neck, which is have a rope put around it and a, and a pulley system or just thrown directly down the well. Because it's metal, it will, it will tip on its side because it's round and, and, the, and the water will come into the side. As soon as a lot of, lot of water gets in there, it becomes heavy enough for it to completely sink and fill up. And then it's pulled up by the pulley or pulled up directly without the pulley. Like that, and then we have water from the well. So that's ritually pure water, like that. That water itself normally is not used directly to bathe, right? We put it in another container, or we have, you know, the system in India. There's a system in India called the bucket bath system, where you have a you have a bucket, you put it down a well, you bring it up, you've got the bucket there, and you have a smaller container. You have a smaller container or loto or a, a small. Um, uh, container like a, with a handle and you dip it in like that and you pour it on yourself from that but you don't use the, the directly the container that was used to catch or to hold to store the water for the bath like that okay so that's my understanding if uh, from we should avoid water in the container that is used for bath right also this 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 vessel that we use for bath Normally, we're not going to use that for any other purpose for, for the deity or for, you know, it's, a, it's meant there for getting water for bathing and maybe not meant for, for getting water for other purposes. Although normally, I think in the normal village situation, people would have a big pot like that that they put in the well like that. And that big put, that pot, they would bring water back to the house and that water would be for bathing. That would, have, would also be for... Um, for uh, for cooking for ritual purposes because it's all coming in a in a in a clean in a clean ritually clean pot made of uh, brass or or some other you know some other ritually pure metal um in some households uh for instance in sri rangam you know i have a house and in the backyard of the house there's a well so we can put we can put a bucket the, of course the water table has gone down quite a lot now so we can't really do this anymore but it used to be you could throw a bucket down or you could throw a kumba down and you could get water from that well and pull it up like that. And what they did in uh, old days before I bought the house many, many years ago, um, so like 50 years or more, or more ago like that, they had, a, they had a small tank which was made next to, the, next to the well, a small square tank, right, made of brick and uh, completely waterproof tank. And people with an open top and a servant would come in the morning and would pull buckets of water up. This is before we had, you know, uh, motors and, and uh, overhead tanks and uh, municipal corporation water and all, you know, uh, you know, connection. So the servant would come and pull water up from the well and pour it, pour, pour uh, pots full of water into this tank next to the well and fill that up with many, many, uh, many, many pots of water for the use of the household for the whole day. And of course, it would be used up over one day and it wouldn't be kept, it wouldn't be kept for many, many days because, you know, it, it's, it's considered that it, it should be in the earth, uh, be purified. The pure, water's pure because it's in the earth and we should keep it there in the earth until we need it to use it and then we bring it out like that and keep it in something else which is pure, like that for ritual purposes. Okay, so enough about that. Let's continue on. 784, text 784. One should not drink milk mixed with buttermilk. Okay, so buttermilk is a form of cultured milk or 
or it may be a t- uh, the, the uh, I'm not sure w- what he's um, translating here as buttermilk. Um, I think piasa means milk. Um, anyway, so buttermilk, you know, technically in, in English, buttermilk is is when you take the cream from the milk and you and, and you take out a lot of the fat from the milk and you're left with some sort of byproduct like that. So really drinking milk with, mixed with buttermilk is, you could put them back together again, it would be whole milk. But I think in this situation, what they mean by buttermilk is some sort of cultured milk, right? Like we have yogurt or, or in Europe, we have some other quark and um, uh, there's, some, there's some other um, forms of cultured milk, right? So like that. So don't mix milk with buttermilk. Don't drink milk that's mixed with, with buttermilk. Okay, so the question might be there. Um, what about what about when we have panchamrita? When we make pancham, panchamrita, when we mix the five, these five things, which include milk and yogurt, when they're mixed together, is this is this rule milk and yogurt or not? So we have to look at the Sanskrit and see exactly what it means. Does it mean don't drink milk, milk mixed with yogurt, or does it mean uh, does it actually mean buttermilk? What they're talking about here, we don't know. Like that. In any case, in any case, they're considered two different things, and to mix them, you know, it's ne- it's neither pure buttermilk nor pure milk. So probably there's some prohibition about drinking things that drinking two milk products that are that are different mixed together. I don't know why. So one should not eat grains that were set aside for planting. Okay. So normally, uh, maybe maybe farmers, if you're not a farmer, maybe you uh, don't understand this, but there's certain grains which are used to plant, uh, seed, seed grains, seed plants, and there are other grains which are ground up and made into flowers like that and, and, or eaten whole, cooked, you know, like rice grains, which are cooked and eaten like that. So um, normally what will happen is that, the, is that the farmer wants the best crop. He wants the next crop to be the best crop. So he takes the best grains from the harvest and keeps them aside for planting the next crop. So the idea is that the ones that are not that great can get made into, into flour and to, to be eaten, right? So one should not, should not eat his seed corn, his seed grains, his seed rice, you know, whatever, whatever seed stock he has, they're also, that's also rice, that's also corn, that's also, you know, barley or whatever, whatever grain it is. Um, but it's meant, for, it's meant for growing the next crop and should not be eaten. If you eat it, then you don't have the seed to plant the next crop. That's the point, like that. I mean, if you can get, if you can get more seed, fine. But but you always want to improve. So, you, so the tendency is to, to take the, the best seed and uh, the best grains and make them into and sow them as seed for the next crop. According to Manu, it's not good to drink the, cow, uh, the milk of a cow that doesn't have a calf. Okay. So, okay, it's, it's impossible for a cow to give, to give milk if it doesn't have a calf, if it never had a calf, right? So the, the, the cow, like other mammals or like other animals that, that, that lactate, that feed milk to their young, right, only give milk basically after they've given birth like that. There may be some, there may be some, some herbs or some, uh, some, there may be some herbs and things like that that, that uh, people can take. Uh, women can take and, and it, will, it will stimulate them to be able to lactate and give and, and make breast milk uh, without having take, given birth. I'm not sure about that. I'm not an expert on that. But, but um, in general, in general, the method of getting a cow to give milk is to have it have go through a pregnancy and have a calf. So here uh, he's quoting Manu and he's saying that Manu says, don't drink the milk of a, a cow that doesn't have a calf. Right. So what we take from this is maybe not that the cow never had a calf, but the cow had a calf, but the calf isn't pre- present. The calf isn't present or maybe the, ca- the calf died like that. 
So for some reason, this cow who can give milk doesn't have a calf, right? That he's saying here that Manu says that that's forbidden to take the, the milk of that cow. Okay, right. Uh, the milk of a camel. So camel's milk, Manu, maybe in Manu also like that. They don't like camel's milk. No, don't use camel's milk. Uh, the milk of a cow whose calf is not more than 10 days old. Okay, so the reason for that is that there's a thing called cholesterol, <clears throat> which, is a, which is a type, very, it's a very thick type of milk that comes from the cow after it gives birth. And the very first milk that it gives, and this may be true for other animals and even human beings, the first milk that is given to the infant for the first few 10 days here, it says, like that contains more, nutrients and more antibiotics than, than, perhaps, than perhaps other milk. So, um, so, uh, so that, that cholesterol is, that type of, that milk is not considered to be, it should be used like that. Now, the interesting thing is there are exceptions to this too. If you go to, Jai, if you go to Ugaipur, which is in Rajasthan, there's the temple of Sri Nati, this is the deity of Gopal that used to be on Govardhan Hill and is worshiped in the Balaba Sampradaya. So that deity, they have a Goshala connected to the temple, a, cow, a, a, a herd of cows, because they make so many milk products for that deity to offer to that deity because he's baby Krishna. And so he's a young Krishna, or he's got his hand up. So he's Krishna at the age where he lifted Govardhan Hill. So that place has so many cows that there's always a there's always some cow in the herd which is which is pregnant and giving birth which is giving birth you know so there's never a time when they don't they don't have some cow in their herd that is not giving this type of milk this cholesterol milk what they do is they produce they produce a certain type of milk sweet only with this type of milk that comes from a cow within 10 days of it's giving birth to a calf. So they make that sweet and they offer that to Sri Nati every day. So they have a standard that that has to be offered to Sri Nati every day. That's that, that milk sweet made from cholesterol, like that. So, so here there's a prohibition given and it may be there in Manu, a prohibition against that. But as I said uh, in some previous lectures or some previous um, videos, right? Sometimes there are exceptions, certain Vaishnava behaviors and certain Vaishnava customs and traditions that are exceptions to things which are stated in the Dharma Shastras like Manusmriti and you know, some of these other Dharma Shastras. There are 18 Dharma Shastras and there are also uh, different Vedic sutra, uh, you know, commentaries on sutras like Apastamba and Bodhayana, and different, different, different uh, scriptures that tell us how to perform uh, daily rituals and, and fortnightly rituals and, and occasional rituals. So, so obviously at Trinathwar and for Srinathji, this is the system and this is the, this is the, uh, the exception. So, uh, right. So that, that, that is given here. So now another thing is milk of sheep, the milk of sheep, right? So we know that for instance, in Europe and uh, some places in the United States, all around the world, um, milk and cheese is used from cows. But however, uh, to a lesser extent in Asia and to a greater extent, I mean, in, in East Asia, in South Asia, of course, you know, in, in India, uh, the cow milk is used a lot. Buffalo milk is also used like that. It doesn't mention here about buffaloes. But anyway, it mentions that not to use milk of a camel or milk of, a, of, of sheep like that. Now, these type of milks are also used in other parts of the world and they make cheese from them. They use them for the milk and, and whatever. Even in India, the cow milk is mixed a lot of times with buffalo milk and you don't get pure cow's milk like that. So some people are very, some people are very um, insistent on using only cow's milk like that. And, uh, and there are many Brahmins in India, even today, whether they're Vaishnavas or not Vaishnavas, they'll insist on trying to get only cow's milk. But in general, because milk is in such high demand in India and because there are also buffaloes, there are also other creatures that give milk like that. So the buffalo milk tends to be 
mixed together with the cow milk in many in many places. If you want, just go to the store, you're going to get what's called toned milk. It's it's milk that is, you know, is put together from buffalo milk and cow milk and like that. So it's not pure cow milk. Okay, so let's continue on. And there's you know there's there's cheeses in Europe which are which are made only from you know, goat milk, sheep milk, camel milk. Here it's here it hasn't mentioned goat, but you know, goats, sheep, camels, whatever. There's many creatures that give milk, and the milk products from those are used in different parts of the world. But in India, especially in the Dharma Shastras, it's, it's described that the cow milk is considered the best milk. Okay. Now, some people also make a distinction between what kind of cow. Like that. That's that's a rarer thing. But there are people who want to take the milk. And they think the pure milk is only from the Indian breeds of cow, and they don't like the foreign breeds of the cow. Like that. Similarly, in Europe, you have a distinction between Northern Europe. In Northern Europe, you have certain types of cows, and in Southern Europe, you have certain types of cows. And the milk that they produce is different, and it has a different um, different effect on people. Like that. For example, my wife, when she when she drinks, when she drinks or eats milk products from Southern European cows like that, it does not affect her arthritis. When she drinks it from Northern European cows, it affects her arthritis. So there's definitely a difference, and and uh, you know chemically there's a difference between uh, certain proteins and certain things in the milk. Um, but here we're talking about for ritual purposes. Uh, according to the Dharma Shastras, the cow milk was considered the best. And these other milks, like from camels and sheep and probably goats, and it doesn't mention buffalo here, but most certainly it may mention buffalo coming up. Um, these are rejected for ritual purposes for um, most, for, for according to Hari Bhakti Vilas and many other scriptures that quote the Dharma Shastras, you know, which are dealing with Brahminical codes of conduct because they want to get people to get the cow milk. Cow milk is considered the best. Now, today we have a completely different set of arguments also about different types of milk. Uh, and you have, um, you have some people who have become vegans. They, don't, they, give up, they give up the milk from the animals altogether and they take to some nut milks or some other type of milk, soy milk or whatever it is like that, because they don't want to associate themselves with the suffering of of bonded animals here, of, of animals that have been, that are bonded like that, right? Uh, uh, it's a bit of a pet peeve for me that some people say also they use this term ahimsa milk, right? Ahimsa. In the case of, in the case of milk, right, the, 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 idea, the idea that an animal may be suffering uh, while in, and be, be kept in, uh, in a suffering condition is, is not good. And obviously, the animals should be kept in a, in a nice way like that. Uh, but there's a sort of a symbiotic relationship between the people and the animal who keep the cows or whatever animals for milk like that. The, the people domesticate these animals. And that means that they, those animals no longer have to have to go out and forage for their own food, but they're given food by the human beings. And in return from that, they have more than enough milk to feed their young. And so some of the milk is taken by the, human beings. This is a symbiotic relationship. So in that symbiotic relationship, there doesn't need to be any real suffering for the animal. The problem is that at, at the end of the milking life of the animal, if the human being decides to kill that animal, right, then that is considered a bad thing like that. So the killing of an animal is bad. The killing of any living being is, a, is, a bad, is bad like that, especially higher living beings like animals. You know, plants, we can maybe justify cutting down trees or, but very, very useful trees like fruit trees and, and uh, you know, and other types of trees, which are very, very useful like that. They should also not be cut down, but, but there may be a reason to cut trees down because we need wood to use, to use for building things or for doing different things or just for clearing the land so that we can, we can plant crops or whatever it is like that. So there, there are reasons to, sometimes to, to kill plants or to cut down plants like that. However, um, these uh, animals also are higher forms of, of, of life and therefore we should try to avoid killing them and also their suffering like that. So some people say, well, I, because I want to avoid the suffering of, of, of animals, 
I will become a vegan and because I believe only in a himsa milk. So if there's a if there's a cow or if there's an animal that gives milk, which is being kept very nicely, which is being kept very nicely by a human being and 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 not made to suffer, right? Then we can accept that milk and we can offer that milk to the Lord, especially if it's cow milk, and we can use that milk. So they call that a himsa milk. A himsa milk should be understood. If you're going to use the term, you should understand it as being milk that is produced without the actual suffering of the, of the animal which is giving the milk. However, some people say, well, even if that animal was kept in very nice conditions, but if that animal was slaughtered after it finishes giving milk, then we can't have anything to do with that type of, of, of farming, and therefore we don't want to support that, so we won't, we won't buy that person's milk. So the system in India is to have a goshala where, or, a, or a cow you know, uh, uh, retirement sort of uh, place where the cows, after they finish giving milk, can go and they can, and they can live out the rest of their lives peacefully without suffering and die a natural death. And the objection, the objection, of course, by Vaishnavas is killing any animal or killing, specifically killing cows like that for meat, for the purposes of taking the meat and eating the meat like that. So that is it. So sometimes people, they'll, they'll interpret the word ahimsa, which can mean nonviolence, but it can also mean non-killing, not killing. So if there's killing involved, they don't want to have anything to do with that milk. So they call that milk, which has no relationship to any killing, that is ahimsa, like that. There's another argument, however, to say that these are all different opinions and different arguments and different people follow them. I'm not, I'm not advocating one or the other. I'm just saying that the, the, cow, uh, the cow or the animal after it's finished its, its, uh, its milking life, right? If a person kills that cow or doesn't kill that cow or sells that cow to be slaughtered or, or that animal to be slaughtered like that, the actual slaughter, the actual killing of the animal is, does not occur during the milking of the cow, right? So the milk that we get, right? right, is not affected, is not affected but if, if a cow is kept happy and, and milked, that how can we say that that milk is, is the product of violence? It's not the product of violence. If violence happens to the cow after its milking life, that's another thing. That's also sinful and we're, we're against it. However, the milk itself is not tinged by ahimsa because while the cow was being milked, the cow was being you know, grass-fed and pastures and very happy and everything like that. So there was no suffering involved in the taking of the milk and the, and the use of the milk. So that's another opinion like that. Um, practically speaking, it's, it's going to be very hard to find milk. You know, if you want to do the research and find a place, in, except in India perhaps, where there are laws against cow killing and uh, you might be, you're going to find some dairies there who do not slaughter their cows after, after they finish their milking life. And that's, that's possible to have purely, absolutely purely free of suffering milk like that. Otherwise, probably, probably every, you know, every dairy in the West like that, they, they, they sell on their cows afterwards, you know, after they've finished their milking life and they don't know what happens to them, but obviously they're probably going to be slaughtered and killed for me. Okay. So that's, that is because that's a demoniac thing and we should try to avoid, we should definitely try to avoid that and not support that if we can. At the same time, at the same time, the, the scriptures uh, ask us to, to, offer, to offer milk to the Lord like that. So we have to get, especially cows, milk. so we have to get it from somewhere. So there may be some compromise involved here. Some other compromises that you have to take into consideration, for instance, um, with, with, in terms of ahimsa, are honey, right? You have to invo you have you you have to uh, enforce uh, suffering on the bee colony to get the honey, right? The bees don't the bees don't make honey for people. The bees make honey for their own purposes, and we take it from them. So we're stealing it from them, like that. So we're inflicting some punishment on them, like that. At uh, some suffering, uh, at this uh, or silk. If we use silk clothing at, at any time, the silk. Uh, in order to get the silk, normally they kill, they boil the silk cocoon, the cocoon of the silkworm in the water and kill the, the worm. Now, in India, they do have a form of silk called makka silk. So if you go to a, a big 
government store like Kadi Bhavan and you ask for matka silk, it will be, it will be a type of uh, village woven silk where they have actually allowed the worm to exit, the, to come out and break a hole and come out from the, uh, and, uh, of its larva stage and break into its adult stage um, from the cocoon, breaking the cocoon. And therefore the strands of silk that they get from such cocoons are short and they have to be tied together. So it's a much more laborious system. And, um, but I, 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 have a, I had a chatter, I had a dhoti of matka silk at one point. Um, I don't know that I have it anymore because I don't normally wear silk, but, but, uh, but this type of silk is also available and it's called a himsa silk or, 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 or suffering free silk. So we can, we, the, all of these things are things that we, if we think deeply about our lives, we can, we can try to minimize the suffering to other living beings and to ourselves um, by trying to be, uh, to avoid suffering with other living personalities, either, either physical suffering or even mental suffering. We should try to avoid that. Okay. All of that from milk of sheep. <laughs> okay. And uh, the milk of a cow who was attacked by a bull. Okay. I'm not sure why a bull would attack a cow like that. Um, but okay. So for how long after the bull attacks the cow, can't you take the cow's milk? The idea here seems to be that when the cow is being attacked, then the cow becomes frightened like that. So when any, any living being becomes frightened, their emotions become very high and certain, um, adrenaline and certain sort of, um, uh, chemicals, uh, are released in the body. Emotional chemicals are released in the body hormones. And they, and they can go into the milk and therefore they affect the milk like that. So just like when we're cooking, our mentality should be um, that we are cooking and we're offering to the Lord, the Supreme Lord. And therefore we understand that our mentality uh, is, should be sattvic so that we have, can make the, the best offering to the Lord. Uh, when you're creating a child, same thing, when you're, when you're, uh, when you're uh, getting milk from an animal, the animal should be very fast, be very peaceful and be pacified, right? So obviously this idea of, uh, of, of uh, a bull attacking a cow or anybody attacking a cow or any animal that we want to milk, that, that puts that animal into anxiety. That anxiety can also affect the milk, right? That's the idea. So text 785 and 786, a Brahmin should give Hantakara, Ar Agriya, and Biksha to guests every, every day, okay, uh, according to his ability, considering a guest to be non-different from the Supreme Lord. So in the Vedas, it's stated, uh, Matri Deva Obhava, the mother is to be treated like God. Pitri Deva Obhava, the father is to be considered uh, 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 treated like God. Uh, Atiti Devo Baba, Acharya Devo Baba, the, the, uh, the teacher is to be considered like God or honored like God. And Atiti Devo Baba, right? That Atiti, the guest who comes, the uninvited guest who just shows up, what to speak of the uninvited guest or any guest that shows, that comes to our uh, place, right? That guest is to be given hospitality and is to be treated and honored like God, like that. So in fact, in the house, in the house, the mood of worshiping the deity in the house is the mood of worshiping God as a guest. So we can imagine God is coming from his place to our place and we have to offer hospitality to him. So that is the mood of a, of a grihasa or a householder in his house or uh, uh, doing worship in his house or any person who's doing personal worship, which is called swarta, not parata. When, you, when we do swarta for ourselves, Worship. We worship the Supreme Lord on behalf of ourselves, or maybe our, ourselves and our family. When we do parata, parata is not a uh, is is para means for the other. Para parata for the benefit of the other, like that. So the pujari in the temple is not worshiping on his own behalf. He's worshiping the deity on behalf of the congregation of the temple, like that, for the benefit of others, or for the loka sangraha, for the benefit of the whole world. Like that. So 
Let's have a look and see what uh, in the Sanskrit dictionary what these words mean. Um, not exactly sure about it exactly. So let's put it in here. We've got Hanta, Hantakara. Hantakara means uh, the exclamation, uh, formula or, ben or benedic a benediction or salutation. Also uh, has 16. Ex also explained as 16 mouthfuls of arms uh, in uh, Sadapada Brahmana, um, uh, along with the four teats of the cow. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so Hanta Kara. Kara usually means a sign. Hanta is this, this uh, exclamation, uh, a certain benediction. Brahmana should give Hanta Kara to the guests. Okay, so he should give 16 handfuls of grains to the guests. Somebody comes and begs at the door, he's supposed to give 16 handfuls of grains to the guest like that. Um, so now we have this other word, uh, agra, agraya. Agraya. Agraya is in Sanskrit. In the transliteration, he didn't put it like that. So let's see, A G R um, A Y A. No. So, Andrea, hmm. Ata, Ata, Graya. Hmm. I'm not exactly sure what that means. <sighs> hmm. Biksha. The word Biksha means arms giving to guests, when guests come to the, the house and begging food, if somebody comes and says, I'm hungry, you know, this is actually the, the, the Vedic householder. Uh, he goes out into the street, he goes out into, in front of his house and he says every day, uh, if anybody is hungry, please come and eat like that before me, like that. He wants to feed the guests. There are, every person in the Vedic society is considered to be born with debt. Born in debt. We're born, we have our body from our parents. So we're in debt to our parents. We're in debt to the Rishis for the Vedic mantras and the scriptures. We're in debt to you know, the Devatas for giving us air and for giving us rain and for giving us sunshine. So, so the, the earth itself. We're in debt to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We're in debt to Lord Krishna. We're in debt to, to, uh, to Sri Narayana for providing this very existence for us. Right. So Everybody is born into debt, and to, in order to pay back that debt, there are, certain, there are certain actions that we have to perform. One of them is feeding guests, feeding guests. So this is called a titi seva or, or, or uh, hospitality in English. So a Brahma should give ha uh, hantakara, agra, and uh, bhiksha to guests every day according to his ability, considering the guest to be non-different from the Supreme Lord, as I said, atiti devo baba, right? Learned authorities have ascertained that a morsel of food is called is is called biksha. Four times this is called agya. Uh, oh, okay, so these are just different types of of arms to give. So if you give one, if you give one, uh, usually what what I've seen is people who go in South India they go around. In North India it's called madukari. You go like a bee to different flowers. So a bee goes to different flowers. A person goes around to different houses and begs like the brahmacharis are supposed to do for the spiritual master. So when they go around and beg, usually what, is, what happens is that, they, that the householder will take a small tumbler of rice and he'll give a, a, he or she will give a rice, one, one cup of rice. So here it's saying that the, the hantakara is, is, I'm sorry, the bhiksha. The bhiksha is, a, is, is giving one, one cup of rice like that, one cup of rice or one amount, one amount, right? Four times this is called ag ag agria, right? Agria. So somebody gives four cups of rice like that. If somebody gives 16 cups of rice, that's called antakara. Okay. So these are just different names for different size, sizes of donation of food that one gives to guests coming to the house to beg food. Okay. So he's saying, he's saying here, the, the rule is that one should give all three, all these three. So I'm not sure whether the Sanskrit says 
that you can, it's a, this is an either or thing, whether you can give all three, whether you have to give all three or whether you have to give one of the three. But anyway, you have to give in charity to these people who uh, um, come to the, the house and, and beg arms. Okay, so now we're going on. Text 787, Mark and Dea Purana says, according to one's capacity, one should first give Hantakara, Agra, or Bhiksha to a guest and then eat. Okay, so according to one's capacity, right? So if one has the capacity, he should offer the most. If he has the capacity, if he's wealthy enough, if he has enough to eat himself, right, he can give to the guests these 16 measures of, 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 uh, of food. If he can't give the hantakar, then the agra, the four measures he can give, or at least he has to give one measure, the bhiksha, right, the bhiksha. Okay, so we, no, most normally we see people, uh, they give bhiksha, they give one like that. It's enough, like that. So it's uh, text 788 to 791. Uh, in some other, uh, other uh, Buddhist countries in Southeast Asia, you actually can go to a shop and you can buy the, the monks, the Buddhist monks will come in the morning and they'll come around with a big uh, bowl, uh, covered bowl, uh, to, to, to beg the alms from different people and people will line up and give them the, give them the alms, maybe cooked food or not cooked food or whatever it is that they give them like that. But you can actually go to some of these shops, they have puja shops or for the for Buddhist Buddhists, and they have buckets or they have bundles of of uh, thing of, of of essentials like toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, um, deodorant, you know, all sorts of all, uh, umbrellas, shoes, you know, anything that uh, a person could could possibly want, right? And they put it and they cover it and they and then you can go and you can give that to a monk, and that will be like a donation to a monk. Okay, so um, 788 to 791 uh, from the Kashikanda. Kashikanda, we don't know what Purana that's from exactly, but maybe it's from the same Purana that we were talking about, this Purana Purana, but, but we don't know. Kashikanda will be the section talking about Benares or Kashi. We have the following verses. One should not eat while sitting on an uneven asana. So if you're sitting on a on a bench or you're sitting on some sort of seat that's uneven, you know, you shouldn't sit there, you shouldn't eat while sitting on a, on a that'll, be, that'll be difficult. I mean, these are just common sense, you know, don't sit on a chair that's gonna collapse or, or a seat that's uneven, or you can't, you know, you're going to rock back and forth or whatever it is. One should, one should not throw contaminated objects into the fire. Once again, fire is considered to be pure. So, Burning contaminated things in a fire to get rid of them is not accepted in Vedic civilization. It's it's not accepted way. Uh, there may be some exceptions in this in in this regard. In modern society, fire is used a lot to to get rid of contaminated things. Okay, so this is here's a here's an injunction that says don't do that. A foolish person who performs the Shraddha ceremony and then eats at the house of someone else who had also performed the Shraddha ceremony simply eats sin. Okay, so this, this requires a little bit of discussion here. So a person who performed the Shraddha ceremony, in Shraddha ceremony, one of the most important parts of the Shraddha ceremony is the feeding of the Brahmins. And three Brahmins will be invited and they, they, uh, they represent Vishnu, Rudra, and uh, the Vaishvadevas. Uh, or the Ashwini Kumaras and the Vaishvadevas, right? Uh, anyway, they, they represent different de uh, devatas and they are, they are fed. And by feeding them, by, by, by invoking those devatas and pitris, they are, they are pitri devatas, right? There are, there are different devatas or different uh, gods that have to do with the pitris, the forefathers, and some that don't have to do with the pitris. So we have pitri devatas. Right, and those pitri devatas have to do with um, those pitri devatas have to do uh, with the shraddha ceremony. So, uh, continuing on. Uh, so, 
somebody who is foolishly performs a shraddha ceremony, right, and then eats in the house of someone else who also who had also performed the shraddha ceremony simply eats sin. So I think what this is referring to is that you call Brahmins to eat in the shraddha ceremony when you're performing shraddha ceremony. That same Brahmin is restricted from eating again in another person's shraddha ceremony for a period, I think, of six months or a year, right? He has to perform Gayatri Japas to purify himself after doing that. And, uh, and so it's just understood that, uh, that you shouldn't make a habit of this, that you go and you, and you are invited as a Brahmin to have the Pitri Devatas invoked in you and to eat, to eat at a Shraddha ceremony. Then you shouldn't just make a habit of that and go to another place and do that. that the person who does that eats only sin. So one does one, one who uh, if one does this, the person at whose house one ate will not receive any benefit from performing the shraddha. So we don't want professional shraddha brahmins, professional eaters at the shraddha ceremony. To we don't want professional eaters at the shraddha ceremony uh, to come again and again at the shraddha ceremony. That's the point. So the point I think which is being made here is that when when we perform a shraddha. When you perform a shraddha, right, you invite Brahmins to, and the Brahmins have to be qualified, and you invoke the Pitri Devatas into the Brahmins, and you feed those Brahmins sumptuously until they're satisfied, right? And then um, after that's finished, those Brahmins, they do prayers chitta, they chant um, Gayatri Mantra so many times to do prayers chitta for doing that, and they also do not go immediately and, and are not invited for a shraddha the next day, but they have to wait for six months or a year before they can do it again but, and sit in the shraddha ceremony and, and, uh, and take, take food. So that's the point being made here. So continuing on, one should not cut his nails or hair with his teeth. So don't, no biting of the nails, no cutting of, cutting of the hair somehow with the teeth. One should not cut his nails with his nails. Don't cut your nails with your nails. That's an interesting thing. Okay. So we should have some sort of paring knife or some sort of clippers to cut the nails. The nails have to be trimmed. They have to be clean like that, especially if we're performing some rituals uh, or worship or puja like that. Just Brahmana is socham. A Brahmana is described in. The Vaishnavas are also like Brahmanas. They're considered to be um, uh, obsessed about purity both ritual purity, spiritual purity, ritual purity, mental purity, and even bodily purity. So we should try to, uh, tr we have to trim and clean the nails all the time. We have to have the hair and the, and the, and the beard and the, and the hairs on the body is also shaved and trimmed at certain times like that. And uh, one should uh, not enter the house or someone else's house through the back door. Okay, so sometimes you have to go through the back door. Um, I think we just we talked about this before the Kumaras, the four Kumaras, those four uh, sages who were brahmacharis and who were sons of Brahma, right? They went to Sri Vaikuntha to see Lord Vishnu and they tried to enter in through the back door and they got into a whole lot of trouble um, with uh, the gatekeepers there, Jaya Vijay. The front door is actually Prabhal and Prabhal. There are, there are different gatekeepers, Prabhal, Prabhal, Dhatu, Vidata, Jaya Vijay, and Ch uh, Bal Prabal, Chand Pachan, Chanda Pachanda, Jai Vijayan, Data and Vidata in the four directions of Vaikuntha, the four gates. So um, normally don't go through the back door, go through the front door. The front door is a more auspicious door. And uh, we could talk a lot about Vastu, where the, how the house or how the temple should be constructed and where the front entrance should be. But normally people, uh, you know, they talk about the back door as being not a good place to go through you know it's it, the back door is there for some reasons for you know exit purposes or like that but don't normally don't normally enter a person's house through the through the back door like that so so it's not a big it's not a big rule like that it's a you know there may be some there may be some situation where you go in the back door of a house or that door is the more convenient door to go in, depending on how the house is situated. But in a properly situated house or temple, uh, according to Vastu Shastra, which is like the Feng Shui of India, right? The, the front gate should be used. 
and the back gate shouldn't be used for entrance. Okay. So one should not bribe anyone. Okay, so this is uh, means bribing means, uh, I think it's pretty clear what bribing means. Bribing means uh, paying someone or giving some a benefit to somebody to do, to do something that you want them to do. Nor should one play chess. Again, we have this uh, idea of chess being a sort of a gambling game like that. It's not, instead of, instead of what it's normally understood of in the West as to be a, a, a game of uh, intelligent strategy or whatever it is, um, so not supposed to play chess. Exactly what that chess type of chess or game is, we don't know. And we have to look at, we have to look at something. One, may, one should stay away from a chess board. Okay. So <clears throat> obviously they're, they're encouraging you not to play chess. Stay away from a chess board. Don't go close to a chess board. One should spit or cough outside the house. Well, if you have to spit or if you have to cough, sometimes you can't exit the house immediately. So you have to take care in that, cover, cover your mouth so that the spit or the cough doesn't affect other persons or, or, or especially if you're, if you're performing a ritual or deity worship, you have to then do Achimana again, purify yourself. You know, in, in, in rare cases, you may have to go wash your face, and, you know, maybe, uh, maybe purify yourself by sprinkling water. Okay. So before bathing in another person's pond, one should evacuate, uh, evac eva eva I think it says evacuate it other otherwise. Otherwise, one, one should excavate it. I think it says excavate it here. Excavate? Hmm. Excavate it. Otherwise, he will share in the simple reactions of the pond's owner. Okay. So this is very interesting. So you've got a pond or a well or something like that. You should put your own energy into helping to dig it, and then you will not have to share the reactions of the pond owner like that. The pond, um, I think dig, digging a well or digging a pond is a pious act, usually considered a pious act. So, we, so somehow or other, the pond, as we said, or everybody's a sinner in this material world. So the person who owns the pond, in this case, uh, has some simple reactions. And if you simply bathe in that person's pond, you're taking advantage of their hospitality. Uh, the same thing when a guest comes to your house, somebody touches your feet or whatever it is like that, you are, you are falling at the feet of somebody. You are, you are gaining some of their pious, their pious results. You're, you're sharing in their, in their opulence like that. Uh, for a, a simple example would be, uh, I go over to see my friend. My friend has a swimming pool. He lets me swim, swim in his pool like that. Okay, so I gain some benefit from going to see my friend because of my friend's punya, my friend's uh, auspiciousness. So he has, he has that, uh, that facility in his house like that. So therefore, I, I also take some of that with me. So as well as taking the punya, as well as taking some advantage of what he has, like that, I also take a share of his simple reactions. This is why people in India they want to they want you to come and eat at their house. They say, please come and eat at my house. We, you know, they invite you over for dinner. Like that, they want to feed you because they believe by feeding a holy person or by feeling a feeding a Brahmin or a, or a or Vaishnava like that, then they will some of their simple reactions will be decreased and they will gain punya or, or merit from doing that. Like that. So similarly, you. If you share in the in the in the in the in the person's merit, this person has a pond. He 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 owns a pond, and you if you use it, if you use his facility, then you have to also take some of his simple actions like that. The the king, for instance, the king has to take a, a one sixth share of all the simple reaction of all the subjects in the king in the kingdom, like that, because he has subjects, and those subjects provide benefit to him so for taking that benefit he also has to take some of the suffering too that this was explained by uh by narada to Bagari the hunter he said uh, you know you kill animals and you you know you're you're engaged in or you're engaged in robbing people like that but your family don't want to you provide benefit to your family uh but your family don't want to suffer the reactions that you that you do that you, that you will get from killing animals or from robbing people like that and he said no no they will and he went to see his family and asked them and they said no no we won't accept it. you know we, we're happy if you want to provide us with 
you know, you know, and sustain us as a family, but we're not going to accept your sinful reactions. So normally that's that's the case. The case is that if you when you serve somebody or you go to somebody's house and for for uh, if you go to somebody's house for uh, hospitality, you get a share of their punya, but you also get a share of their papa, their sin as well. So they're auspicious and inauspicious actions. So uh, text 790 to seven, uh, 792. Text 792 in the Brahma Purana, it stated a, a, the food of a person who holds, who holds it in his left palm and eats it with his right hand. The food of a person who holds it in his left palm eats it with his right hand. Obviously, he's eating it with his right hand because he has to eat it with his right hand. But should he put it in the palm of his hand? That's the question. Or who blows on it to make it cool, right? So if you have some hot hot food, you know, that comes to you and you blow on it, right, with saliva from your mouth and everything like that. Or who eats it while spreading his fingers. So if you're eating with your hands, you know, Many people in this world, some people in this world, they use utensils to eat, like spoons and forks and knives even, like that. And other people use chopsticks. Like there's, there's, there's probably twice as many people use chopsticks as use, as use your hands. I think I read it somewhere that there's many, many more people that use chopsticks than use, than use sorry, than use uh, knives and forks and spoons. And then beyond that, there's even more people who simply use their hands. So normally the right hand is used to eat the food. And you keep the fingers together, and you take the take the food and take and, and pass uh, mouthfuls of food into your uh, handfuls of food into your mouth, like that. But here he's saying, don't eat food with your with your fingers extended. If your fingers are extended like that, that's a very gross way of eating food. And so one should have the now. Of course, uh, anybody who's ever eaten in South India, you know, the, the food usually, um, and in some other parts of Asia also, they give you a big plate of rice and the rice is flavored with different uh, sources like rasam and sambar and buttermilk and etc and in order to in order to mix the rice with those things you do have to squeeze the rice and squeeze those things in it before taking small handfuls of food and putting them in your mouth like that so that's not what's being s- said here but it's said just as a matter of etiquette don't eat food with, with your right hand with your, when you're doing it with your fingers spread Keep the fingers close together like that when it's done. Uh, is, so all of these three is considered, the food of all of these three people is considered to be the meat of a cow, so equal to the meat of a cow, like that. Right. In the last line here, it says go mamsa. Go mamsa means the meat of a cow. The word mamsa means meat in Sanskrit. Mam saha. Uh, mam means me and saha means you, like that. So the word mamsa or meat comes from the two words me, you, in Sanskrit. What it means is that this is this is basically what we think of. Um, if, if a person a person who eats meat or kills an animal like that for eating meat like that, he he will say this to the to the animal mamsaha. Mamsaha means me for you, like that. For your life now, I'm killing you. For your life now, in the next life, me. In the next life, you can you can take my life like that. My life for your life, your life now, my life later, like that. So that is the word mamsa in Sanskrit. That's where it comes from. Meat. Okay, so go mamsa means the meat of a cow, and uh, which is considered very sinful to eat the meat of a cow because it's such a holy animal, such a useful animal in this in Vedic society. Even the bulls are useful for plowing the fields, for giving us the cow dung and uh, and uh, um, so many products from the cow. And uh, even after the cow dies, the, the leather can be used. And, uh, you know, it's very, very, very useful like that. There are many, there are many medicines in Ayurveda which are made of cow urine. Um, of course, we have, the, we have the milk products which are produced by the cow, the milk, the yogurt, the butter, the ghee, or all of these things. So there are so many things that come from the, from the cow. So the cow is considered very, very useful like that. And therefore... The meat of a cow or killing a cow to get the meat of the cow to eat the meat of the cow is considered very simple. And therefore, these three things in this in this uh, sloka, which is interesting, very nice, it's a nice pramana. So food of a person who holds it in his left palm and eats it with his right hand. So it's not the, the point is not eating it with the right hand. The point is you shouldn't keep the food directly in your left palm. Now, 
In actual fact, many people do this in South India or in India in general. Yeah, when eating a banana, one peels a banana, places it in his left hand, breaks off pieces and throws it in his mouth like that. So there are many people who do put food in the left hand. The idea would be to cover the left hand in some way, to cover the left hand in some way, either with a leaf, right, with a leaf or with some sort of plate right, to eat the food from, like that, so that the food doesn't directly touch the left hand, right? Otherwise, it's considered to be equal to the meat of a cow, right? Blowing on your food, it's considered to be equal to the meat of a cow, right? Or eating with your fingers spread, it's considered to be eating the meat of a cow. Okay, so this is according to Brahma Purana. Okay. All right. So now, text 793 to 795, in the Atri Shmiti, it's stated... One should never milk, excuse me, one should never drink the milk of a cow whose udder is either too big or too small. Too small or too big. What does that mean? Without, without telling us the size that it has to be, it's very difficult to follow this instruction because we don't know what too small means. We don't know what too big means. Like that. Too small may mean that the, that the cow is undernourished or the cow is uh, having some problem producing the milk or has some sort of disease. Too big may mean that the cow hasn't been milked for some time and that the, the, the milk in there is, is, or maybe the cow's udder is diseased in some way like that or too, or too big. Um, so both of these, too big and too small, are not good. So we should not drink the, the cow milk from, from a cow like that. However, exactly what it means by too big and too small, we don't know. Okay, so one should not drink the milk of a cow that eats stool or other abominable things. Okay, so we shouldn't drink, especially in India, a lot of people have cows and they let the cows roam freely and there's not a lot of grass. They're not, they don't let the cow go and be fed by uh, beautiful hay or grass that they brought or that, they, that is there in the pastures, but the cows wander the streets and they eat all sorts of things because they're hungry like that. So here it's saying you shouldn't drink that type of milk. You shouldn't drink the milk of a cow like that who's just, subsisting on garbage especially stool or other things this is the difference between a cow and for instance a pig pig pigs will eat stool pigs will eat stool like that so it's considered a very uh simple or not simple but very dirty animal very contaminated animal because it eats it, it's its whole food is stool um there is also a statement in manu that says if a person eats a particular type of animal he's known by the name of, of, a, of, an, uh, of eating that particular animal. For instance, there's a person who's called a chandala. A chandala is a dog eater. It's also, also swapacha, swa, 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 the word swa in Sanskrit means dog. Pacha means to cook, so dog cooker. Swapacha is a dog cooker. Chandala is a dog eater, like that. So, okay, so then you have, so then it says, but, so you, you may be known as a, you know, a horse, a horse eater or a goat eater or a sheep eater or, or, me, or a cow eater or whatever it is like that. But if you eat fish, if you eat fish, you're considered to be uh, an eater of all sorts of animals like that. Because the fish eat stool. If there's stool in the ocean, you know, a lot of times uh, in coastal areas of, of India and Asia like that, people will go to the bathroom down on the beach and now they get washed into the, the ocean, the fish will eat that, like that. And the fish are also eating other fish, you know, they're eating other things, so like they're eating a, a abominable things in the ocean, like that. So eating a fish is considered to be the worst, it's considered to be the most um, contaminating thing like that. So, so it, it, there's a statement in mind that says, if you eat a particular animal, you're known, as, you're known by that name, you're a dog eater, for example. But if you eat a fish, you're known as the eater of all about abominable animals, or all animals, not just abominable, all animals like that. Fish is considered worse. So some people, uh, by this logic, some people could say, well, eating fish is worse than eating a cow, even like that. Anyway, Vaishnavas, we don't really have to have all of these rules for eating fish and eating cows and things like that, eating, you know, because we don't do those sort of things like that. There may, however, be. Some people who do those things, um, normally they're not worshipping Lord Vishnu. They're not following uh, 
like that. There may be rare instances of people who are non-vegetarian Vaishnavas. That's, there's a possibility in the Hobalam, we have a tribe of people called Chenchus who feel that Lord Narasimha appeared in their tribe and married their, married Chenchu Lakshmi, uh, you know, who was, a, who was a part of their tribe and, and therefore, you know, they are non-vegetarians. But uh, in general, in general, um, you know, Vaishnavas and Brahmins and people in general, higher class people in India, uh, tend to be uh, vegetarian and they're, they're against uh, the suffering of other living beings, especially animals, like that. So, okay, so one should not use <clears throat> the milk or dung of goats, cows or buffaloes. Ah, you got to buffaloes. Okay, very good. All right. So I'm not sure exactly where the buffalo is mentioned in Sanskrit. But there we have the there we have the statement in Hari Bhakti Vilas, don't use what are we talking about? The cow, the, the milk or the dung of goats, cows, or buffaloes. Goats, cows, or buffalo. One should not use the milk or dung of goats. Then it says cows. That has to be a mistake. Why would it say don't use the milk or dung of cows? Okay, so we have to look at we have to really look at the uh, at the Sanskrit here and see what what is said. This is this sounds like a sounds like a vegan <laughs> a, ve a vegan uh, vegan slogan here. Don't use the don't use the milk of cows. Somehow or other, he's put cows here in the translation. I'm going to have to look at this one, and uh, and I'll let you know maybe in the next session um, if there's any word that says cow there. Maybe and maybe it means particular type of cow. Okay, we don't know. Okay, so why he's translated that as cow. And, but buffaloes, I understand. Okay, so buffaloes. Um, they say that uh, uh, Vishwamitra, when he was a Brahman, he was a Chatriya, who was a king, and he wanted to become a Brahman. He wanted to become a Brahma Rishi and get the same powers as Vashishta. So this is a story in the Puranas. And so he tried creating many things to show that he was a Brahma Rishi. In order to show that he was a Brahma Rishi, he wanted to show that he was just like Brahma and he could create living beings. So he tried to create a human being, but he could only create a coconut. The coconut's very useful, very good food and very useful for many things, but it's not a human being. It only looks like a head of a human being, it had, like a head with hair. The, uh, the, he, he tried to create a cow, but he created the buffalo. So he created a buffalo instead. So this is a sec these are considered second class when compared to the, the things that Brahma created. So he never became a Brahma Rishi by doing those things because he couldn't quite match Brahma's prowess in making human beings and cows by making coconuts and, 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 uh, and buffaloes. So buffalo is considered second class like that. So therefore, again, we don't use the buffalo we're, or we're, we're told here that there's a there's a rule that we shouldn't, we shouldn't use the dung or the milk of a buffalo. Uh, that eat abominable food for performing sacrifice. Okay, so we can understand the use of the use of we can understand that perhaps perhaps it's the end of the, the sentence which is important. So that we should not use the milk or the dung of goats, cows, or buffaloes that eat abominable food for performing sacrifice or other ritual. Okay. So we can, we can infer from this, if we, if we look at this logically, if we take this exactly the way it's written and we say, one should not use the milk or the dung of cows, of goats, cows, and buffaloes that eat abominable food for performing a sacrifice or other religious ritual. They eat abominable food. Okay, so the purpose here is, we're going to, we need milk. We need milk and dung, cow dung. We need, need milk and animal dung for performing the sacrifice or other religious ritual. Other religious ritual could be uh, offering to the Supreme Lord, offering food. Okay. So whatever ritual purposes we need, we need some milk and we need some dung. We can get it. We can get it from goats, cows, and buffaloes, but not, not if they're, they eat abominable food. So like this. So this we could actually logically turn on its head and we could say, therefore, we can use the milk and the dung from, from goats, cows, and buffaloes, right, um, if they don't eat abominable food. 
So, for example, if you go to if you go to the uh, if you go to the store and you see that there's buffalo cheese, mozzarella is buffalo cheese, by the way. All those people who like Italian food, Mo mozzarella is made from buffalo milk. Okay, pure mozzarella, right? Mozzarella cheese, uh, and there is also some uh, other cheeses like machego, or so there's some other cheeses which are made from uh, or uh, which is made of sheep cheese actually, but goat cheese. There's goat milk cheese also, which is made, right, in the West, not so much in India, right? All of these cheese, all of these milks, milks, cheeses, and duns, all of these things, or yogurt, they, they, they have goat, goat milk yogurt, they have buffalo milk yogurt. These can be eaten if the animal was not eating abominable food. That's the point, like that. So all of you people take notice, like that, all the people who, who, Say you cannot eat goat, you cannot offer or eat goat uh, goat milk or buffalo milk. Here it's in, it's saying that you can eat it, but only if those animals are not eating abominable food. So don't feed the animals abominable food, right? And then you can take their milk and use their dung. That's the that's the whole point. Like that, brushing one's teeth with one's finger. Right, which a lot of people do in India, they take some tooth powder and they put it on their finger and they brush their teeth like that. Uh, using raw, using raw salt, brushing one teeth using raw salt, or eating clay. Again, eating clay was something that that Mother Yasoda was um, was uh, upset at Lord Krishna for doing. So these are considered equal to eating cow's meat. Equal to eating cow's meat. So that's a very interesting. Um, sloka here but what i find interesting very much is this is this um mention of goats cows and buffaloes eating abominable food so what it seems to be saying is that the shastra is saying that you can take the milk of certain animals of course before we had we, we had a mention of cow we had a mention of um didn't we have a mention of uh camels and sheep right Did we have sheep I think we had, yeah, sheep, milk of sheep and milk of camel. That's supposed to be, that's supposed to be not taken, right? But here it's saying, here it's saying the opposite. It's saying that the, uh, the milk of the goat, goats and buffaloes as well as cows can be taken unless they, those animals are eating abominable food, right? Like that. And so they also have some, some things that they that, that they feed uh, cows with, uh, even in the West, um, which may you know they may include certain hormones and certain different things in the cow feed that that are that are abominable. And if they do, then we shouldn't take the milk of that. We shouldn't even take the milk, even if it's cow milk. So, in this regard, exceptions. Now we're coming to exceptions. So there were some general rules there. Now we're coming to the exceptions. Om Namo Narayanaya Om Namo Narayanaya